Oh, it's me. Probably. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, Dan. Hello. Okay. Yes. All right. Sorry, the, the earpiece had to go in. Everybody ready? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, to our virtual audiences as well, we're really excited to have this conversation. Um, Long so I'm a Morning Edition host, Rupa Shinoy. We're gonna do a quick introduction first, and then I'm gonna set the scene, and then we're gonna get in onto a conversation. Um, basically, in June 2020, there was this statue of Abraham Lincoln bestowing his grace on an African-American man. And the Boston Public Art Commission uh, voted to um, tear it down. And Christella was there, and it sent her on this series of thoughts uh, that sent her on a trip through the South. And we're going to be here going through each city and talking about what she saw in each city. But basically, this is a space for us to talk about what happens next with Confederate monuments, because Absolutely. we usually see it on TV when the question is, will it stay or will it go? We don't stick with it afterward. So this is a space for us to have a conversation with some women who are really good to talk to on this subject. So Christella, would you mind starting with the introduction? Sure. Um, I'm Christella Guerra. I'm a senior arts and culture reporter uh, at WBUR. I'm very happy to be here. I'm so glad to be with all of you on this stage to have this conversation. Um, hi, Mom. <laughs> I know. She's in Florida and she's watching right now. Um, essentially, uh, I was covering it on Zoom. It was in the middle of the pandemic. And when they voted on it, there were hundreds of people in the chat expressing opinions about a monument that had been there for decades that they didn't like that no one really liked. And there was a child, there was a mother who remembers her son saying, mommy, that, that man is in shackles and it looks like daddy. So it comes to a point you, where you wonder, how does our, 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 the space around us, how does it affect us? Um, do you even notice it? You know, could you imagine your own community and, and a, a monument that maybe lingers with you? I, that's where I want you to be as we're having this conversation. And hopefully the experience is immersive and I'd like to introduce one of my very, very best friends. I'm Jennifer Ortiz. I'm a photographer based out of Florida, native Floridian, and I've known Christella for a long time, which is how I ended up here because I'm not from Boston. Uh, and I ended up here on a Boston-based assignment. <laughs> um, do I tell you that now? Or you yeah, sure. Really? Yeah, because so, my mom didn't want me driving through the South by myself. Yeah, basically. If, if it we're was honest. that. And yeah. I was like, sure, I'll tag along. And it was Christella, her two cats, myself, and my son. Yeah, the cats were not happy. Yeah. <laughs> Neither was a teenager for part of it. No. Hello, my name is Erin Genia, and I'm really excited to be here with everyone today. I'm a multidisciplinary artist, I'm an educator, community organizer and a former artist in residence for the city of Boston. Um, during my tenure, I organized a series of events called Confronting Colonial Myths in Boston's Public Space, where I invited indigenous artists and leaders from our area to speak about how monuments and memorials in public space contribute to the public health emergency of racism. Um, I'm a Dakota person. I'm a member of the Sisseton Wapatinoyate. And I'm just excited to be here with everyone. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Kiara Singleton, and I am the executive director of the Royal House and Slave Quarters, which is a um, museum that talks about the history of slavery in the North. Um, I am also an American Democracy Fellow at the Charles Warren Center for the Studies of American History at uh, Harvard University. And, you know, a lot of my scholarly work is about thinking um, through uh, slavery and carcerality, both in the South and also in the North. Um, I am delighted to be here um, with you all today. Um. So before we keep going, I need to remind everyone about Slido and how you can be asking questions throughout. That's basically who I am. I'm you on stage. <laughs> and you send me questions, and I will be your voice. 
So um, you have to type in hashtag newsmakers. Don't forget. Uh, why did so we're starting in Florida? But why are we starting in Florida? Um, so a lot, of, a lot was closed. Um, that was January of 2021. Um, the monument that in 2020 had been decided to be removed was removed December 31st of 2020. And my sister was getting married in January and then she wasn't because of the pandemic. Uh, and I stayed, I was allowed to work um, that month, which was the same month as J6, the insurrection. Um, my, at that time, my mom was living with my aunt and my grandmother and I hadn't seen them most of the year. So I was allowed to spend time with my family, which is a real blessing. And um, I remember thinking, you know, people assume the North is not a racist place, that the North was where people fled to find a different life, um, especially antebellum. But I mean, we, I, I'm assuming we all know that's not true, hopefully. Um, and I, I wanted to understand what the North could learn from the South, because the South is inundated with this imagery. So just because Robert E. Lee isn't on Boston Common does not mean that we don't have similarly problematic monuments, let alone um, have a city that's lacking in images of people who've been here. Um, I think, Aaron, you'd mentioned something earlier to me that I thought we'd set the stage for as well mm -hmm. in terms of what the land represents in general. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And thinking about Boston as a kind of a ground zero for a colonization of this continent, I think it's really important when we talk about public space to kind of look at it critically because the concept sort of has, I would say like ut a utopian ideal about it. Um, that there's, you know, there's this idea that people are, of all different kinds are gonna come together in public space and work out our issues. But what we're forgetting about that is that it really is a settler colonial concept. All public space in the United States is stolen land, stolen from native people. And to many native people, is still considering that um, they're considering the space to be under occupation. So that is really something that I, as an artist working in the public realm, have always wanted to bring forward so that that could be a really important part of the conversation. So we begin in St. Augustine, in part because it was one of, it's the oldest city in the country. It's in Florida, it was near enough. But also it's a place entrenched in history. Mm -hmm. um, it's also one of the starting points for the Trail of Tears. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be seeing photos and yep. hearing sound from your trip throughout. Uh, I think we have one to start out with, the Florida Monument? Yeah. What's the sound? So we're in... Um, essentially what's Arby Haling Park. Um, he is called the father of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, he was one of the major players in enacting that law out of St. Augustine. And what people don't know is St. Augustine was one of the bloodiest sites in the 60s uh, for civil rights. There were, it was the place where if you remember the image of a woman in a pool um, and a man is throwing acid in the pool, it was the swimmen. They were trying to integrate pools. And that activist actually passed in 2020. Her name is Mimi Jones, and uh, she lived in Roxbury. Um, St. Augustine was a place where people were beat on the beach for integrating the beaches. It was a place where downtown, the Confederate monuments were places where the Klan marched, that we were told, and people were pummeled in those spaces. But when you go to St. Augustine now, you don't necessarily see a lot of that history. You have, there are pieces of it. You just wonder, I think our question was, why isn't there more? Yeah, St. Augustine is a place that sells itself as a historical ancient city. Um, but when you get there, it's a very touristy version of history. It's more mythology than anything else. It's the Disney version of, you know, the conquistadores came and civilized everything. And there's a fountain of youth there. There's a fountain of youth, which also, by the way, is not a true thing. That like, is actually something that was taught to us in school in Florida. But Ponce Leon was looking for the fountain of youth, and he wasn't. He was just looking for fresh water. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that you go there, and they'll actually sell you this whole myth as history. And meanwhile, steps away from the part where they take you through mm -hmm. is Lincolnville, yeah. which has actual history, right? There's, and even before the civil rights movement, mm 
uh, St. Augustine has a lot of black and indigenous history. A lot. Um, you know, first free black settlement. Yep. Uh, Port Mose. Is there, and you barely ever see any sort of uh, acknowledgement of it besides an occasional plaque. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something that they highlight. Um, and then for a while, you had these enormous Confederate monuments right there in the middle next to where they sold people. And there's still a slave marketplace still, in the middle of St. Augustine. Yeah, there's still the place where they sold people. And there's just a little tiny plaque. There's no real like acknowledgement or art of that. Well, and because, there's some steps on the floor yeah. to like acknowledge the civil rights movement that took place there. Well, they have a, they have a, a bust of the actual <laughs> local freedom writers, but that came up in the last 10 years. Yeah. It's you went to the Lincolnville Museum. We did. Yes. And executive director. We have, we have some of Regina Gale Phillips, the executive director of the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center. There are a whole lot of other stories that need to be told that haven't been told. And so what we try to do, keep collecting oral histories from people and um, building on that, telling, you know, pieces of those stories that we can piece together because a lot of those people are gone. They won't be back. They're not going to promote the fact that Seminole Wars uh, intersected St. Augustine culture here, that um, the beginning of the Trail of Tears was here in St. Augustine. She sounds kind of tired. She works a lot mm -hmm. and she's on every committee. Um, she was a really, she was a wealth of information. There were people there who just, they know their history. Um, it was really remarkable to be there, to be present, but then to find this park with those chimes, but it was a really cold day and I think we ran out, it was sort of this right on the river. It's called the Matanzas River. Matanzas means massacre. It's the massacre river in St. Augustine. Um, she had a lot to say. And then you also met a man named Jimmy. Yeah, we met Jimmy actually at the museum. Yeah. Um, Jimmy's incredible. Yeah, Jim, uh, Regina introduced us to Jimmy. Do you, do you want to talk about him? Um, sure. <laughs> I don't feel like I could do Jimmy justice, but yeah. um, so Jimmy, when I think he was, he told us his 18. whole story, he was like 17 or 18. Yeah. And he was a freedom rider. Right. Um, he would go to the swimmings and, and I think, was he in... Well, he was, he was on the beach. He was on the beach. And there was a man coming at him with a... Was he also on one of the buses? Yes. Yeah. And then on top of that, he told us a story about a time where the, he was spying on the KKK and they kidnapped him. Right. And almost killed him. Yeah. And then he kept going back. Um, so we got... It was incredible because we got to hear actual history mm -hmm. um, from one of you know, the few activists from that time that are still alive. There's a few. There's I mean, few. Um, so Clennon King did an incredible documentary. I'm going to shout him out because he was a, we did a lot of pre-reporting with historians. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mr. Nolan, who was a historian in St. Augustine, walked me through downtown where the monuments once were, um, told us about the history. Jimmy doesn't think the monuments should have necessarily been no. moved. He still protests there. Why? He, because he says he feels like he needs to be seen. He, he wants the reminder by that monument. He, he want, no. What he told us is we needed the reminder of what this, you know, people need to know what people this were, was. What, what happened and how people thought acted. and acted. He, but, he thinks they should stay as a reminder yeah. of the atrocities of the past. Yeah. Um, if you notice, Jen's photo had uh, burn marks. Yeah, the, the monument that's there. Um, is one, well, there were two monuments in St. Augustine that were moved to- um, Private property. Pro yeah, private property. Right. Um, I think from one of the descendants. Um, one no, of it was just someone, it was a businessman who was basically helping uh, the city. So he, he, he foot the bill on the moving of it. There were people who were signed up to move the monuments. They got death threats, so they had to get new people to move the monuments. <laughs> The day of when they moved the monuments, there was a whole memorial around the monuments by descendants because those monuments are obelisks. Mm -hmm. And what they would say is that they were veterans mm -hmm. and that they, those monuments were put up way before those who that were put up to intimidate. Mm -hmm. But they were moved onto private land. And at the time, I don't know if now, we still have to sort of investigate that. It was going to be another park yeah. where this man was going to say, bring all your Confederate monuments. Yeah. Let's put them all here. 
and it essentially was another place to sort of pay tribute to sort of the same myth around yes. uh, the Civil War, which was that, you know, although the South lost, they won. So the solution, well, not solution, but if we go back to the question of what happens next with these spaces, with these monuments, the answer, one of the big answers there was privatization. Private property. Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. That's a very popular solution in Florida. Out of sight, out of you mind. You put everything on private property, and that's your right. And you do whatever with it, and you can't touch it. And they talked about replacing them, but there was so much ire. And there were so many death threats at those who wanted to remove them that the city doesn't want to deal with it. They just yeah. want to let the emotions not flare up. It was a Settled massive out. fight yeah. to move these monuments. Huge. We have a question. Uh, do people have a blindness to the history myth of St. Augustine? I think it's across the South. Yeah. You know, yeah. do you all have, I mean, like, history myth in general. In like, general. Yeah. I was going to say, if please can, like, I what do they mean by that? I don't think that's only a Southern thing. Yeah. I think I mean, that's a very you, American thing. Do, do you all want to contribute? Well, I mean, I think when it comes to these monuments, um, these these conversations around pride, these conversations around, you know, we're just uh, memorializing these veterans who who died, you know, people are not being honest necessarily, right? We have most of these monuments that are enacted throughout the South that are correlating with lynchings in America. Um, they're coming up in 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, 1920s, and then they reappear again before the civil rights movement. And essentially, these are all around times in which specifically black communities are getting Black members um, are trying to get into po politics. Um, they're asking for voting rights. They're asking for, um, you know, housing rights. They're asking for better labor conditions. And so the idea that that they're just a symbol of pride just erases the terror and the actual violence that that other people, other communities, black communities in particular, um, experience. And you know, for me, when I think about it, I say, OK, the myth, like, what are you holding on to? It's a conversation about white supremacy. It's a conversation about power. It's also about what happens when black people and then people of color get into public space and you can't control them in the way that you want them to control them. Yeah. You you know, they can live wherever they want. They can, you know, they're part of um, the public life. And people do not like that. What do you think of what Jimmy said? I mean, just saying, at least we have a reminder of mm -hmm. history there. Well, I'm not going to disagree with uh, <laughs> Jimmy, because I think that that is, I think it's important. I think some people, they don't want history erased. And I think that the, the issue is, you know, well, if you get rid of it, then what comes in its place? So I think Jimmy is asking, well, if we don't have this reminder, then who's going to remember this history? Who's going to remember what happened to me and other people who look like me? Yep. And so I can understand where, where, where Jimmy is coming from. But then that is also about who controls history, yeah. um, who decides what monuments are erected, who decides what history is celebrated. And then that becomes the larger, you know, conversation. Which is happening in many states right now, the conversation about critical race theory. Mm -hmm. um, you also spoke with the uh, Reverend Ron Rawls. Yeah. I don't, I didn't want to see it on property that black taxpayers that our dollars went toward. They can do whatever they want on private property. I've never in my mind thought that I could erase racism and hate. I would be crazy to think that. They can't, you can't do that. Those people are gonna hate regardless. Um, but what I can do is remove their their foot, um, their, their, their footprint and, and the pressure that they put on our society. I can remove that from, pla from places that we have a right to occupy. Pastor Rawls still receives death threats. Yep. He moved to Gainesville. He's not in St. Augustine anymore. He's in a new church. He's heading up a new church. He was the face of the movement to remove the monuments, especially after the, the most recent tragedies, I think, in Charlotte's, in, in after South, Charlottesville, South Carolina? Oh, no. Virgi Charlotte's, Charlottesville. Virginia. Virginia. Virginia, yeah. sorry. I think that's when things really, really like so it was there. basically when I saw this, it was it was the catalyst for toppling monuments were, was tragedy, and it's almost as if these monuments were symbols of 
pain. Mm -hmm. And so people, he decided every quarter he would march downtown and he would lead people silently the way that they did in the 60s to, to shed awareness on what these monuments actually were. And it was at times where the city of St. Augustine was hoping to make money, right? Like when tourists were downtown, it's not, it doesn't look good. Um, and he, uh, it wasn't a stop that we were gonna make, but we felt like we had to meet Pastor Rawls because he was at least a modern face of this, of this fight. Mm -hmm. We have another question from the audience. Do you think that removing these monuments is attempting to erase part of our history? No. Mm -hmm. I'm I adamant don't. about that. Aaron? No, no. I don't think that monuments are history. Monuments are art history, but you know, studying history, like if anybody has studied history at university, you don't write history based on a monument. You write on news reports, yeah. oral histories, uh, documentation. You know, you, if we're talking about how we remember and the history of of art and, and public spaces, yes, but taking down a monument does not erase history. That's what I think. Erin, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah. Yeah, I think a monument is really a focal point for so many different things. Um, it's a focal point for, for domination of a site and of a people and of a place. And when it is championing a certain myth um, about how the United States came to be, it is extremely harmful to people um, who, who continue to inhabit that place, that space. I think thinking about how history is taught, I mean, so many people don't even know that tribes continue to exist as sovereign governments. People don't even know here in the state of Massachusetts that the name Massachusetts comes from a tribe. So, you know, without that um, study of history and that you know, honest telling of history, we leave the field so wide open for this hatred to come in and affect us. And I think um, in particular for, for Native people, we're, we're suffering from uh, a lot of terrible things that we can kind of relate back to this erasure of history. For example, um, there's an epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Yeah. And, and that's a huge thing that's happening. Um, but you know, you really don't see that, and you don't you don't um, see it in the news. You don't see it um, really talked about. And I think it's directly related to this mythological um, history that we were celebrating. Mm -hmm. You next headed to Alabama. It did. Why was Alabama a stop? I wanted to see the EJI. I don't know if you all know Brian Stevenson and the work that he's done for you know more than thirty years at this point in Montgomery, but the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, not only works to help get uh, people off death row, but um, he built um, a site to honor lives that were lost to lynchings mm -hmm. um, in a city that honestly still feels the ramifications of, I mean, just the war fought by, by black people just to, just to live. Uh, Alabama's one of the few states in the nation that has a committee to preserve its monuments. So any monument over the age of over 40 years old cannot be removed. You will be fined 25 grand. Yeah. And not just removed. You can't rename it. You can't recontextualize it. You can't move it. You can't deface it. When was that put in place? 2017. Whoa. And currently, the person who authored that bill, it, I think it went up into committee this past month, um, is trying to raise the fine to 5,000 a day. Um, and then as a bone, I guess, like in that bill, they wanted to also mandate uh, to build a monument to uh, John Lewis. Hmm. It's compromise. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's like, seemingly, <laughs> we'll give you this, but yeah. we're also gonna charge you $5,000 if you try to rename like a school. Birmingham paid it. Birmingham paid the fine to remove a monument. Yeah. Uh, Montgomery is not. Montgomery is the White House of the Confederacy is still there. Um, the, it's the cradle of the Confederacy. Yeah. Mo I was there this week. And uh, it, uh, there are new monuments coming up in Montgomery because if you can't tear them down, people are building new ones. Yeah. And that's what Different the EJI spaces, is. Though. Different so spaces. competing history. Competing mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have some sound of a civil rights memorial. Yeah. That's Brian Stevenson's uh, at the EJI. Oh no, this one. Oh, not, this, this is, is the Civil Rights Memorial. Yeah, so this is the Civil Sorry. Rights Memorial. Yeah. Well, 
Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah. Um, that's the place that's been keeping tabs on what monuments are falling. Sorry, I forgot. Um, the water's significant because you'll notice the quote by MLK, but also every city that we've been in has a port, and uh, those ports carried people. Mm -hmm. Downtown Montgomery still has the place. People know where the auction block is. Nearly every building uh, downtown at some point held enslaved people. Mm -hmm. um, Commerce Street, we know what's sold on Commerce Street. Yeah. So it's insidious. It's sort of under, just under the surface. You visited the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Yeah. Uh, Kira, can you tell us about that, that museum and what it means? Yeah, so um, I haven't been there yet, um, but it's on my it's on my list to get. Um, but um, it's a really amazing place because it memorializes um, the people who were um, hanged, beaten, shot, drowned, um, lynched, essentially, um, uh, after um, the emancipation. Um, of uh, black people. And so it is the only monument um, of its kind. And so for me, it's really, really important because um, what happens when you don't know their names? You know, you don't often um, read about people who were lynched in textbooks. You know, they cover it. This is what happened. But who were they? They were people. They had families. They had lives. And so by having this in public space, by having this in a museum, it is essentially saying that their lives matter, that this history matters, and that you're going to deal with it when you come here. You can't get around it. It's not easy. It's hard, but it's essential to understanding um, conversations about freedom and justice and equity in this country, that they are still happening today. Because lynchings were like a cultural mechanism, a, a ritual. Yeah, um, there are scholars who have done amazing work about um, action, actual lynching postcards, um, where people would go to a lynching and they would take pictures and then they would, you know, uh, send it to family members or friends, and they're just, you know, scenes of a postcard. You know, that's how um, prevalent um, uh, the disregard of black lives was in this country. Um, that they just, you know, circulated um, as postcards for people to, you know, give updates to, you know, different family members across the country. And then you met an artist named Michelle Browder. All of these women are bigger than life, like for me, right? So Anarka is 15 feet tall. Uh, Betsy is about, I think she's 12, and, and Lucy is nine feet tall. Um, if you look through most of them, like the African tribes, I really tried to take a lot of the African culture. This is a symbol for love, an Adinkra symbol for love, uh, strength. Um, their back, their backs, the, the lumbar is that of, um, you know, like your, your skeleton, but it's made out of the Adinkra symbols. Um, the scarification in African cultures, the back of Betsy has humans on them, which symbolizes the slave ships uh, and how they were trafficked to um, Turtle Island, if you will. The speculums on Betsy even shows the, you know, from the pewter spoon that was used to um, really torture these women, that they, J. Marion Sims took the, the spoon to, uh, to try to find the fistula. And, and so now it's a crown for Betsy. Um, and then her cornrows kind of go around it. So they were birthed out of pain but also because I wanted to change the narrative. I wanted to change the conversation about black women in this country and what we have to contribute and the infant mortality rate and reproductive justice and, and you know, uh, maternal health. We are in a crisis and we're hoping to um, elevate the conversation. Yeah, through art, history and courageous conversations. Yeah. So this is an artist who's answering the question of what do we, how do we change the narrative? How do we change what we honor as public art? 
When we met Michelle, it was the week of Rosa Parks' birthday. Mm-hmm. And she was putting out a press release saying she was going to build these women. And she was going to drive through, I think she went up north on, I don't know if she was on the PCH, but in California, she collected scrap metal from women. And then went and met with Burning Man artists in San Francisco and learned how to weld and built them from scissors and bike, bike chains and um, had this vision of what she wanted them to look like since she was 18 years old when she learned of these women whose names are Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy. And those are the names that we know. And there is a doctor that I'm not even going to say his name, although I think she did, from South Carolina, who thought that it was a good idea to experiment on in these enslaved women without anesthesia. And their bodies led us to have milestones in the field of gynecology, something that isn't taught to many OBGYNs. So she created these incredible, incredible monuments to honor her ancestors. And then a year later brings this week, the reason I was in Montgomery, doulas and midwives and OBGYNs, many women of color, to talk about the racialized history of gynecology and to talk about why they care so much about black mothers and the fact that black mothers have three to four times more likelihood of having complications during pregnancy of the assumptions made about black women in pain, of the fact that over the last 18 months, many, many mothers, black women specifically, have died in the hospital unnecessarily. So it was a day of reckoning. It was a soft opening for her park. She has other things coming, but they toured the actual building where these experiments were performed and the women in there could feel sort of the heaviness of that place. And I don't know if you noticed, but there was one artist, because she built it with many artists, but Deborah um, built the the womb itself. And she put um, these red shards to represent pain. And there was a tiny, tiny hand reaching out inside the womb that represents the babies that were lost. And these doulas said that all the time they hear from black mothers, could you just make sure I don't die? You know, could you just make sure that, like, I am able to, like, bring my child to life and and survive this? Because infant mortality rates among African Americans is incredibly high and disproportionately to whites. Exactly. Uh, We have an audience question. Um, They ask, what did it feel like to stand near one of those statues? Sacred. A lot of the women there took their shoes off. They placed flowers. They were reverent. Um, I'm, I'm doing this story for NPR also, but they um, almost seemed like they were protecting the women because they couldn't before, because that's what doulas do. My mother's a doula. They protect women. They make sure that they can get them through the pregnancy. Uh, and they were mostly women there. There was also a man who actually lost his wife. His name's Charles Johnson, and he founded an organization uh, in his wife's name. Um, and passed a bill in 2018 to help uh, get funding to actually investigate maternal uh, mortality rates when mothers die, when hospitals don't look into themselves. How do we we find out information? Um, It was very, very powerful to be there. And it's right next to the EJI. So she sees herself as a a little sister of Brian Stevens and the work he's doing in Montgomery, you know, because you have massive... Confederate memorials in Montgomery. Mm-hmm. So all over the place. All in front over of the, the place. state house, which means you can't really touch it. And you have a memorial yeah. to the doctor that did yeah. these things. Yeah. So yes. now we have there's the so called alleged father of gynecology. Now you have the mothers of gynecology. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that it's close to the EJI because and that uh, the statue of Anarka and Betsy and Lucy is a place for healing and mourning. And the EJI is also that. It's very, very much like, uh, that's something that's drilled into you if you've ever visited or you ever get to visit. You know, there's no cameras, there's no recording that, you know, that's not particularly graphic because it's very conscious of the terror that people still feel and it's a place to mourn. And, and, and so, which brings us to the point of monuments are also something that make us feel. Right, like art is supposed to make us feel, and if monuments are art, then what are all of these monuments making us feel? 
Exactly. And that goes back to the idea of terror, mm -hmm. of all these monuments that were put up by the daughters of the Confederacy in like the 40s as a reminder, because it wasn't that this is history, it's that we want to make you feel something. Yeah, but one of the things that I also love about Michelle's work is that she's in a long lineage of black people who have always spoken back to these monuments. And um, I wanna go back to 1890 in South Carolina. There's a woman named um, Mammy Garvin Fields who uh, recounts a story about a monument that was um, erected to honor um, John C. Calhoun. and when she talks about walking past it every day as a little girl, she talks about all of the uh, black people who were chipping away at it, who shot at it, who, um, you know, spit on it um, because they didn't want it there, you know? And so that rage too, that community members felt as though if we can't get rid of it, we're gonna create an alternate story. And so, that, that I think that's really, really important to think about the ways in which um, these communities have always spoken back um, to these monuments, whether that is through um, defacing them all the way to creating new um, monuments to challenge the dominant narrative. I want to bring Erin in to kind of bring an indigenous angle on this because it's uh, in a lot of public art and a lot of statues, we have representations of Native Americans. In the, I was in the state house the other day in our state seal and so forth. And um, someone pointed out to me that that's what white people thought Native Americans looked like and not perhaps what they actually look like. So it's not like a, a obviously demeaning art, but it's also perpetuated. And how do you feel about that? Well, I think that many monuments that depict Native American people that um, were created by the dominant culture, they portray a romanticized image, exactly what you said, of what white people thought of as Native people, sort of like the noble savage. Um, and you see that all over in this state in particular, but all over. Um, and I think that there's a very special kind of racism that is um, unique to Native American people that um, is about authenticity, um, that in order to, um, you know, be actually be Native, because there have been so many laws that have attempted to um, eliminate Native people from this land, that you, you have to look a certain way, that you have to do certain things, that you have to fit into this stereotypical image. So it's extremely problematic, and, um, you know, that's why I'm so heartened by artists um, coming forward and addressing these issues in particular. And I think I, I also wanted to mention too, just thinking of, it was really interesting what you said about sacred spaces. Because um, I think, you know, monuments make us feel, but they're also placed in the sites that they're placed with the notions that they're upholding because there is something sacred to someone about those things. And for native people, Many of the um, monuments are actually put up in, in these you know, very um, insulting and derogatory monuments are put up in sacred spaces. For example, um, Mount Rushmore um, is a monument that was created on the Six Grandfathers, a sacred space to Lakota people. Um, so you know, that's happened all over. And I start to think of, you know, if this is sacred, what, what does that, you know, how can somebody think this is sacred when it has caused so much harm to so many people? We are very fortunate to have another guest that we're bringing in from New Orleans. Okay, while we're waiting for that, we have a clip that we could, we want you to hear. <laughs> Where is it from? Uh, we were in New Orleans just before Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras just passed this week. The universe is a funny thing, the way it lines up in, in some ways. But I love this photo. Jen, do you want to talk about this photo? Um, yeah, I can, sure. I can fill in the, 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 the um, We were interviewing the men in front of Lozelle. Lozelle. Um, and in New Orleans, because they already did take down their monuments, 
um, lots of empty platforms. And so we asked, or you had the idea to ask each person that we were going to speak to, um, to pick one out, to pick one that meant something to them or they had feelings about or wanted to talk about. Um, and so he picked the former platform for the, I think it was the Battle of Liberty Place, uh, locally known as the Monument to White Supremacy. Monument um, to Whiteness. Yeah, it, it was, it was to, it was put up to remember when, uh, during Reconstruction. Yeah, during Reconstruction, when they took back. White legislators yeah. tried to take back the state Power. house yes. from black legislators who were there making. Like, they had just started yeah. beginning the process of Reconstruction, and there were mass lynchings, yeah. and there were incredible massacres, and they wanted to recognize it. And it was there, I think, in a major spot in the middle of New Orleans, and then they decided, well, we can't have it here. Yeah, so they stuck it by the aquarium. <laughs> So they put it's it a weird by, little spot. and now it's in front of a, it was in front of a parking lot until yeah. five, seven years ago, Yeah. Uh, and so right near the river. Empty platform. And so he's like, well, pick this out. And so while we're interviewing him, this woman, or actually right before I was going to take the picture of him, right. this woman walks up and gets on the platform and starts dancing and throwing beads. And she's just like, she had no music. So she was making music with her and mouth. Like, you just heard like, like through this whole thing, which I love. She called herself the spirit of New Orleans. Yes. yes. And she's, and, and, and Flozelle looks up at her and says, she's literally dancing on a place where there was blood. Like the blood of our people is on that monument. And she's reclaiming it for black joy. Me, we have Mia back. Would you mind introducing her? Of course. Um, professor, I, I think we're Hi. bringing her up. Yeah. Yeah, we, all, we all introduced ourselves awkwardly. Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> sure, I will introduce myself awkwardly. Uh, I'm Mia Elbonaris. I'm an associate professor of art history and Africana studies and also director of the Africana studies program at Tulane University in New Orleans, also Bulbancha, uh, the place of many tongues, uh, which is the name, the Choctaw name for the greater New Orleans area before settler colonialism. And I am speaking to you from the ancestral now and forever home of the Chattayaki or Choctaw and Chittimacha people. Can you tell me a little bit about how you see monuments and oh. what <laughs> should happen to them? I would say specifically in New Orleans. That we talked to Professor Benares in front of the Jefferson Davis Memorial Pedestal. That, that was where we talked that time. That is uh, how I see monuments is a very big uh, question, especially in New Orleans, because I come at this both as a scholar, um, but also as, as a native, as a native New Orleanian who grew up um, in the shadow of these monuments. Um, and I, I was really thinking, Christella, about what you said at the very beginning of, um, of, of this session um, about how it is to sort of live and grow up with these objects in our midst, right? Do we even notice them? Um, and I can tell you as a child growing up, I didn't really think about their significance necessarily, right? Lee Circle was to me the place where the Esprit store was. I never thought about who Robert E. Lee was and I'm dating myself, um, but um, as I got to be older, I thought about how these monuments really oriented me in the city, how they were the landmarks by which I marked space and geography. Um, and uh, I, I really am, I, I want to, to think about um, the concerns of, um, of the elder you mentioned, Jimmy, who didn't want to see the monuments come down because he he felt that like there needed to be a record of that kind of um, atrocity, right? And I I definitely don't have that take that position, but I do think we need to think about that second question of what comes next, right? Because for me, especially as somebody whose work is centered in history and uh, my scholarship is all about thinking about the role of, of images and visual culture um, in connection with uh, slavery, colonialism, empire, and nation building. And 
I'm thinking of a landmark that was very important to me as a little girl. I spent a lot of time in the New Orleans Art Museum where my mom um, was, you know, a docent, where I took classes uh, in the basement, art classes. I, I practically grew up there. The security guards knew my name. Um, and right in front of the, the drive up to the New Orleans Museum of Art was the statue or the monument to Beauregard, um, which was one of the ones to come, the first to come down. And I, you know, the only thing that's there now is a flower bed. There is no record that there ever existed the public will to put that monument up. And so for me, the question about these monuments is not necessarily, well, I mean, obviously the question of, of, of bringing them down or should they come up or stay, stay up or go down is important. And I, and I do believe that we should uh, take them down. But how do we then make sure that we are actually confronting our history as opposed to just erasing it, right? The monument um, is not the truth of history, but it is a record, right, of the kind of ideologies that it represents. And while those ideologies may be, uh, may be um, uh, you know, anathema to many of us today, I don't want us to ever lose sight of the fact that the entire landscape of New Orleans, right, is, is in some ways constructed around these markers meant to mark the city as a white dominated space for all time. Because um, the idea of a monument, right, is that it never comes down. So if we're going to take those monuments down, I want us to really actually confront that history. When our mayor talked about bringing the, the monuments down in a historic speech, right, that was, you know, reprinted, I think, in the New York Times, you know, the, the, the phrase that stuck in my head was, instead of revering a four-year brief historical aberration that was called the Confederacy, we can celebrate all 300 years of our rich, diverse history of a place named New Orleans. And I was thinking the Confederacy was not a four year aberration. It was the culmination of a fight to maintain what it had existed, you know, and, and continue to exist. Now we're so we just celebrated our, our, our tricentennial, but right, that those, those monuments represent more than just that one moment in time. And they are about, you know, the colonialism, the, the, erasure of indigenous space, the, um, or the, or the st stealing of indigenous space, the transporting of, of um, enslaved people. And all of those things, um, I don't want to, I think that we need to figure out how to deal with these sites so that we are actually confronting those, his those histories in ethical and responsible ways, as opposed to just replacing the things that we don't want to look at with beds of pretty flowers. Mia, I was thinking about you, it reminds me, um, you know, there are many different angles on many different feelings about what should happen to statues. And we think of ourselves as a very divided society right now. Um, but then we also think about, everyone's thinking about Ukraine right now and thinking about, uh, com coming tonight, I was thinking about the, the Lenin, the statues of Lenin that they de very deliberately tore down a couple of decades ago, um, but still there, even though there was a lot of uh, agreement on that Lenin should come down, they didn't know what to do next. There's no framework for this, is there? I don't know that there's necessarily a framework, um, and I don't know that necessarily the same solution will work for every space. Um, one of the things that my colleague Adrian Enignast and I are, are working on in a, a, a seminar, a, a Mellon Foundation Sawyer seminar that we put together uh, called Sites of Memory, is really thinking about site specificity, right? So I don't think that there's a one size fits all solution for what we should do with all of these um, uh, with all of these deposed monuments. Um, in fact, I think that one of the the, the, the interesting things about these um, monuments as 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 visual culture objects is that each one sits in space in a very particular way. It would be hard, for example, to turn 
uh, the site of the former uh, uh, monument to Robert E. Lee into just a plain flower bed because of its huge column, because of all of the infrastructure and, and architecture that they built around that colossal monument. Um, so I think that what we do in Lee Circle has to, or what what is now, what was formerly Lee Circle, um, and what we do in other sites um, is going is always going to have to be different. And I think that we need to pay attention to the very specific sort of cultural history, the social histories, um, all of the the different communities who are um, uh, who are uh, affected by that site, um, and think about what the best way to move forward for each one is. Um, personally, I think that until we make those decisions, we need to keep those plants empty, right? Or invite, maybe invite other artists to create installations on top of them. But I don't want to see the architecture that's around them come down until we have thought about each one. I'm thinking about how the site of the Jefferson Davis Memorial has become such a potent sort of contested site the day that Jefferson came down. Right, um, a street artist had had spray painted uh, Bulbancha forever on the site of the pet of, of the on the pedestal of the monument, literally reinscribing the indigenous past, present, and future of that site that uh, white supremacists had tried to claim as their own by installing Jefferson. Uh, so they thought for forever, right? Um, and just last Mardi Gras, um, uh, Demande Melanson. A uh, big chief of the, I think it's the Wild Seminole. Uh, don't don't be mad at me, Demond, if I got your yes. The the young Seminole hunters. Sorry, um, big chief Demond Malonsan installed uh, his uh, black masking Indian suit uh, in a glass case on top of that same site. Right. So we're seeing how that site is becoming um, a space that black and brown people are claiming as their own to reinscribe their own histories and their own rights to public space um, over um, the sites that white supremacists had tried to mark as their own. We have one more clip. Oh, and we also have the picture of Mia standing um, in the place of the Jeff and I love that Jefferson picture. Davis. Yeah. And then we have a clip of Jeffrey Derensborg mm -hmm. in Congo Square. What's Congo Square? And this was a, originally an indigenous dancing ground of one of the First Nations that lived here, the, the Homa Nation. And then it became a dancing ground for indigenous people and enslaved Africans who, under the French and Spanish regimes, usually had Sundays off and would come here and uh, dance and a lot of people think those sort of interactions are really the roots of American music. Uh, a lot of American music begins here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I've had wonder, Jeffrey come and speak in my class before. Mia, would you just uh, would you speak to what's in Lee's circle now and what it's what's it what's it called now? Uh, sure. So. Um, in that space, uh, as part of Prospect 3, which is, um, or I guess, no, sorry, Prospect 5, um, uh, Prospect is a triennial contemporary arts um, uh, uh, exhibition that goes on throughout the city. Um, Simone Lee has installed uh, a work um, in that space now. Um, the work is called uh, Mamiwata or Seminal or Sentinel rather. Um, and it is uh, in some ways a brilliant challenge to um, the, the column um, that we um, once stood atop. Um, uh, some, it's hard because it's Robert E. Lee and Simone Lee, but Simone Lee has, has um, built um, has built this uh, the sculpture to be at ground level to sort of recognize the the um, the grassroots um, work that it took to bring down um, uh, Robert E. Lee and also to um, you know have a, 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 an experience that people can uh, even though the, the the sculpture itself is very large can kind of meet on a more human scale. Lee was perched atop a very tall column to really kind of be a like to surveil the city, right? You know, this a kind of all-seeing 
uh, white supremacist eye, kind of like a panopticon. Um, and this works, uh, Simone's Lee, Simone's Lee, Simone Lee's work works quite differently. Um, Mama Wata is a water deity um, associated um, with many African diasporic um, uh, communities known by different names, Yamaya, Yamoja. Um, and in this way, she so Lee sort of diver alludes to the diversity of of Black life and Black diasporic traditions, um, but also kind of making connections between all of these. Um, and as a sentinel, right, it really acts as a kind of guardian, uh, I think, is is uh, is her idea. It's been very controversial. There have been many um, uh, newspaper articles in our local paper um, denouncing the figure as demonic. It's the figure of kind of um, uh, of a, a feminized figure with a serpent going around it and a spoon as a head. Um, and one of the things that I think is challenging um, about putting a different kind of object in this space, trying to make new monuments, right, that don't follow the code of what a monument looks like, you know, a very representational, naturalistic, you know, usually a man on a horse um, type thing, is that the public hasn't yet learned how to read new monuments. So in thinking about how we install something new in public space, right? Um, thinking about how to make that legible or whether it's important to make that legible, I think is, is a critical question. Um, I personally love Simone Lee's work and, and I found this a really um, interesting intervention, um, but I think that as a long-term solution for um, for egalite circle, as it is now known, um, I think that um, we still need to figure out how to do more to challenge the sort of uh, the landscape uh, architecture and infrastructure that's already there. Viewed from certain angles, that sentinel is really powerful. You have to kind of get up close to it as you're driving by it. Uh, it can sometimes be difficult to miss. I mean, easy to miss rather, um, or to kind of get the, its full power. So I think that's that why these spaces can be so challenging to, and why we have to think about each one in a very site-specific way. We kind of wanted to end this conversation by coming back to Boston. And we have an audience question that's going to help us. What lessons should the rest of the US take from what New Orleans has done with the monuments? I. I feel like it's so interesting. I didn't realize that Simone's sculpture was channeling Yemaya, because the mothers also channel Yemaya. It's this matriarchal like image, the, the mother, the woman, the, the feminine energy that's coming into these spaces that were so often uh, white supremacist, misogynistic, and, and sort of uh, they came hard. And so I wonder if I can offer just a challenge. I don't have answers. But what would Commonwealth Avenue look like if we all had input into that space? What would downtown Montgomery look like if black people who'd been there for centuries actually got input into their own spaces from a sort of Afrofuturistic, like I'm a sci-fi geek, you know, like how do we reimagine spaces in the next 50 years of our life? What do we want to see around us? You know, does it have to be, I remember when me and I spoke, does it have to be ephemeral? Does it move? You know, I love that people think the statue is demonic. I also really enjoy like disruption. I think monuments are becoming disruptive when in the past they were sort of uh, that insidious nature was somewhat like understated. The intimidation was we're here and we're in control. We are unfortunately running toward the end of our time. Do you think that we could go through once and kind of share our reflections about what Boston could learn from what we've just discussed. Yeah. Kira, would you, you want start? me to start? I'm sorry. Um, uh, so Boston can learn a lot of things. <laughs> um, Boston has a lot of reckoning to do with its history. Um, uh, at the Royal House and Slave Quarters, um, I told Christella a story that when a lot of the monuments were coming down, it led a lot of protesters to the museum. And they were like, there's a slave quarters in Medford, burn it down. And I had to go, no, 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 no. <laughs> They're different. 
Um, they're different things, and we need to talk about them differently. Um, but I think, you know, I said, you know, right next door, the park is named after the enslaver royal, and then there's a royal street right next to it, right? And so it's really important that when we're talking about these histories, there is a lack of understanding of how the North contributed um, to slavery, of the ways in which it dispossess, dispossess indigenous people of their land. And instead, there's a fairy tale fiction about the North being, you know, the site of just the Revolutionary War and on the site of justice, but, you know, and abolitionism. But if there's abolitionism, what are they about? abolishing. Um, and so I think we have to start there and thinking about reckoning with that history and then looking all around these public spaces that are often named after enslavers, that the vestiges of slavery are literally built into the environment um, in Massachusetts. And we're not really dealing with it. So I think we got to start there. I hope the conversation goes from there to the, I mean, a lot of the people in the South went to school here. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Erin, sorry. Oh, no, that's, that's really true and actually leads into kind of some things that I've been thinking about as an artist working in public space that, and as a Dakota person, that what this white supremacy that's been so prevalent for hundreds of years has done has um, created the conditions where people of color, indigenous people, black people, people from different walks of life are not in positions of power. And so um, it has created the conditions where Western cultural supremacy pervades everything. And you know that includes white supremacy, but it also includes the way that we think about the natural world, the way that we think about each other. You know, when I think about um, Simone Lee, who I love, uh, Simone Lee's piece being compared to a demon or thought, thought of in that way, like we just don't, because we're so steeped in this Western cultural supremacy in the ways that we learn, in the institutions that teach us, the colleges, universities, you know, education systems, um, that Western cultural supremacy has um, really denigrated tribal and indigenous ways. So we don't have frameworks to understand those stories, and we look at them as primitive. So the more that we can, um, you know, create platforms for people of color, indigenous people, to be in positions of power, to be making the decisions, to be creating um, these artworks, to be challenging this Western cultural supremacy. That is what we need to do. Jen? Well, I'm not from Boston, so I feel a little odd commenting on that. Um, what I can say is that speaking to uh, the fact that so many people are educated and then uh, come down to the South. Um, it's, and you see that also in Florida, right? Like that's how I ended up in the strip in the first place is I was documenting something else about Florida where people like to cut South Florida off from the rest as if the entire state isn't governed from Tallahassee and we don't all have to live with these policies. And as if this, South Florida isn't racist, which it completely is, as if lynchings never happened there. Um, so the same thing happens in a micro way in the state of Florida, but also the entire country. Uh, you know, coming from Florida, everybody always wants to get rid of Florida because we're crazy down there, and, and it's you know it's, it's a very wrong. special place. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's to me a microcosm of like. It's America like distilled, right? Like we are a system, you know, the entirety of, of our country. Uh, what happens in one place is gonna happen somewhere else. You can't just say it's over here and this is over there. And I see that happen a lot with people up here up north. One of the things that people in the South love to say is that Boston is more racist than the South. I don't think it's that. I just think it's a little bit different. Um, but I think that what Boston could learn from the South is that it's an incredibly diverse place, incredibly diverse. And the real monument is the, the real monument to white supremacy is like the system, right? And that system is up here too. Mia, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, Jennifer really uh, hit the nail on the head, head there. And I can say this as somebody who uh, went to high school in South Florida and uh, 
went to college in Boston um, and has uh, lived in New Orleans for most of her life. Um, that, um, you know, for me, this, this conversation about monuments is actually a much bigger conversation um, about thinking about really getting at the heart of the system, right? Um, of structural and systemic racism. It's the, these things are symbols of that. But, you know, I cannot display my son's high school diploma without also displaying the name of an avowed segregationist. He graduated summa cum laude from a high school named after someone who vehemently believed he had no right to be there. And all of the, our public education system is a monument to white supremacy. An inequality of healthcare access is a monument to white supremacy. Food deserts are a monument to white supremacy. Voter suppression is a monument to white supremacy. Uh, in New Orleans here, the tour in, tourism industry that you know, depends on, uh, de on an under a permanent underclass of service workers who are educated in that public education system, right? We kind of, our whole economy is based on having people at the bottom. All of these things are monuments to white supremacy. So while I want to see the, the, the physical monuments fall, I also want to see um, these sort of systemic issues that are also monuments in their own way to white supremacy uh, fall. And you know, for me, those two things are tied, right? Um, there's been a lot of conversation about you know, the names of things. You mentioned Royal Street and the name of the park. And um, you know, my son's school is, or my son's former school is, is really dead set, uh, a, large, a large part of its constituency against changing the name. But like, how can you ask black children to go to a school that's named for somebody that didn't want them there and expect that they are going to feel as though they have been welcomed into that fold, right? How can we have a, a public education system that's not a monument to white supremacy if we're not willing to make these symbolic changes as well? Christella, before you go, would you mind starting with just to take us all the way back to the beginning, to the Abraham Lincoln bestowing his grace. What has happened to that spot? Um, right now, I think they're still working through it. Mm -hmm. I think they're still trying to figure out there was a plan in place potentially with a city in the Midwest, but I think it's still in storage. And it's interesting because there's also a, no a monument to the love of, of Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King that will be coming to the common. and that's going to be paired with a, a justice center in Roxbury, I believe. Um, and so I think what we're seeing is whether people like it or not, things are changing. Mm -hmm. And I think those faces that are at the forefront of it are those who are oppressed by it. Yeah. And uh, something Jeffrey told me stuck with me, which is Jeffrey and Klee Klee Bear. Um, what if we have monuments to the land? What if we have monuments to the water? What if we have monuments to the things that feed us as human beings, um, that nourish us? What if we m memorialize that which um, keeps us alive? What would a world like that look like? We could obviously talk about this for a really long time. <laughs> the good news is that this is just a sneak peek, a preview of a podcast episode that will be coming out pretty soon. We'll see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, is it is, and the show is? Uh, last Scene. Last Scene. It will be, a, it will be an episode on Last Scene, um, but there's more reporting to do, I think. Um, we went back to Montgomery. I'd like to potentially go back to New Orleans, me, if you'll have me. Of course. Everyone is always welcome in New Orleans. Jeffrey promised to take us out. He did. In the canoe. Yeah. Through the bayou. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take him up on it. <laughs> Very excited. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it, all the different perspectives. It's been a really interesting discussion. So, and I, I could talk to you for hours, so thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us online and here in City Space. Uh, this is just the first of a newsmaker series that we're holding at City Space. Uh, the next one is on April 5th, and it will be with our investigations team. 
And um, this is the team that exposed Massachusetts's civil forfeiture laws. So that's essentially the money that uh, police confiscate and what they do with it and how there's very few rules around it. Um, but thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mia.